May I thank you very much, and if I might maybe allow uh, just a few words in uh, my own ancient language, uh, in which I have, and which I've been so much interested. Uh, Thomas Hall of Adwirti, for Father Sutton, Fielkin Fulcher, Parishes, Rome Hainis, Ruth, Mavan Kalis, Savi, and Ashtor, is the Dini Thor, and Shia Lum, Agus Tigim and Thor the Thor. A quit lower gogol of the skin of Krakas, man of the copper of the mayor, surely this million dollar chip. May I now just say I'm continuing in the other way? But the Irish language is 5,000 years old. It is 3,000 years older than uh, Christianity. Uh, it is still spoken and it's spoken every day in my office uh, from time to time. Need we take in that? We don't impose it on you. <laughs> but we invite people to hear it on occasion. <laughs> May I begin by wishing the Second World Conference on Live Performance uh, every success. I wish you the very best in your efforts, and your conference, I believe, is such an important event. Uh, and I think it's discussing all of the challenges facing actors and the live performance sector in the 21st century. I looked at the programme, and looking at these working sessions, I saw that they address very directly all of the main issues that affect the lives of performers. <coughs> and I was very impressed by this list of panellists that have been assembled. They're drawn from over 20 countries. Of course, both parts of the island of Ireland, Canada, Switzerland, France, Belgium, Egypt, Turkey, the United Kingdom, Norway, Morocco, Russia, the United States, Germany, Australia, Spain, Chile, the Netherlands, Brazil, Denmark, Zambia, Greece. And of course, then there's participation from UNESCO and the European Parliament. Now, in case people are worried about that listing, I read them as they occur in the panels in the program. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, from that, such an inclusive list of panelists, there is no doubt that you are approaching these challenges facing live performance from a global perspective. Uh, it's very, you have, I want to thank you for your references to my wife Sabina. Uh, Sabina has mem been a member of, of Equity, uh, which in turn made its way to SIPTU. Uh, I was a founder member of the Workers' Univalent teaching section at the university level, and it became uh, then after that the Federated Workers' Union of Ireland, and then it became SIPTU. So we are both now located in SIPTU. <laughs> <laughs> so, and as well as that, I can tell you that I'm, my life has been very enriched from this indirect relationship with Konstantin Stanislavski. <laughs> now, <laughs> last thing I'll say, uh, as, as a family, we have a very close connection with theatre, and even earlier this week, we were at an incredible, incredible, wonderful performance of the Gili concert in the Gay Theatre. Marvellous work of, of Tom Murphy, brilliantly acted, brilliantly produced. But returning to the main purpose of your meeting, in a number of recent speeches that I have given as president, I have attempted to address the theme of labour and of culture, and that extraordinary concept that lies central to both the nature of work, and inevitably the shared issues that lie in this area. In February of this year, I was honoured to be asked to give the Edward Phelan Lecture to the International Labour Organisation, uh, organised by the ILO and the National University of Ireland. I decided to address the issue of the precariat. Now, the precariat is a term now on regular usage in the media to describe a contemporary situation whereby large swathes of the active population of European countries, in particular of the media we read here, but of course it's a global phenomenon, who find themselves trapped in chronic job insecurity. Guy Standing of the University of London, in his book The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class, defined the precariat as a multitude of insecure people living bits and pieces of lives in and out of short-term jobs, without a narrative of occupational development. As I read those words, it occurred to me as I was going along to be speaking to yourselves, I could well imagine a, an audience of performers saying, 
Uh, but that's us, and nobody seemed to have noticed uh, for many years. But, but then in May, I was speaking to another group, members of Estona, an association of Ireland's leading artists, which serves as a mechanism to provide financial support to a certain number, about 250, of our creative community. I remember before it came into existence, I would get occasionally when I was in Parliament, letters from poet friends of mine to say they're turning off the electric. All Estonia did in the end was give security to some of our most prominent artists. I won't delay on that just now, but on that occasion it struck me yet again that Standing's description of <coughs> precarious was of course one that many artists would recognise as a description of the regular and unchanged condition of the performing actor in society. I want to address that. And as I addressed the issue then in those two speeches recently of the position of the precarious worker, I began by contrasting the vulnerability of the insecure worker with the concept of decent work. Decent work, by which I mean a socially grounded and holistic understanding of work as a source of personal dignity and freedom capable of providing security for the family and which serves as the basis for prosperity in a community but for democratic flourishing and participation most of all. And that is important. I am delighted to be here in Liberty Hall and to be able to say that this debate about what constitutes work, what constitutes decent work and the rights, as it were, of those who have certain forms of economic power to reduce the content of work below a level where it can carry a basic dignity is a struggle that affects us all. And it is one that cannot afford uh, to be cited. For performing artists around the world, the problems they face are made ever more acute, I believe, as well, by the absence of clearly articulated cultural policies within which the importance independence and democratic value of the artist and the work that his performance might be properly recognized and respected. I say this with some experience. Yes, I was Minister for Arts, Culture and the Gate of Ireland between 1993 and 1997. I also was President of the Council of Culture Ministers of the European Union in 1996 and I was President of the Council of Broadcasting Ministers. I look back on those years as years where we struggled to try and make progress at the level of the Council of Ministers. And I recall so clearly, and we'll write in the future about the atmosphere that I recall from those days. Briefly, Melina Mercuri sat next to me as Culture Minister. Artists, like all others in our society, are entitled to decent conditions of work and to know that their role and their contribution to society is understood and respected. If we are to have any meaningful discussion then on the place of the arts in any society, we must as a fundamental starting point release ourselves from any romantic notion that artists thrive on poverty and that penury and indigenous, indi indigenous act as some kind of necessary liberating force on creativity. It's what I call to my friends, the, an, an Irish phrase for it would be, at the end of the day when they'd ask you how you live, but sure ye must love us. <laughs> the poverty, the insecurity, and all the creativity that is springing from us. <laughs> we must also recognize artists as workers, workers, workers engaged in valuable and productive occupations, workers who have a right to engage in collective bargaining. And what a battle we had when I was a member of Parliament on that issue. And it went on and on and on. I remember the competition authority sailing off to the High Court to suggest that each, person, that each artist was an individual business and that their trade union had no right to collectively represent them. An issue I know that is not fully over and an issue that is not an Irish one an issue that is at the heart of the thing, because I saw on your own seminars that you're discussing the importance of collective representation. 
And then, too, there is the issue of such a worker should be, it is reasonable to anticipate, a right to a basic pension security and a social protection, a social protection which is sensitive to and takes account of the regular nature of their work. Around the world, to how many offices of social welfare provision is the actor faced with the question, but what is your real job? <laughs> Not gone yet. Providing the necessary protection and supports to actors as workers, this requires a comprehensive approach that covers the full life cycle of the artist. Acting is a profession with specific and varying forms of professional formation. It does not include any of the well-defined career paths leading to promotions, pay rises, and increasingly secure lifestyles that are sought or enjoyed by many other professions. How often I have heard it in recent decades where someone would say, where I want to be in 10 years. Now, this isn't quite a question Beckett would push. <laughs> Yet it's democratic importance, the arts world, as the democ it's the democratic importance of the world of the arts. The history of democracy tells us it is immense, as is its function in releasing and sustaining creativity, creativity that is essential for our shared lives. So it is important that we support artists at times of ill health and in leisure life, just as we seek to nurture those embarking on the creative careers. And as issues of funding are being discussed by you as well, you will find much of the private money will come in to assist emerging artists. But artists are part of a life, they have a life cycle too. What happens when the arthritis sits in? And what happens when, in fact, actually, the juices aren't flowing in relation to your writing in the same way? Of course you're doing your, you're living your life differently, and the life itself is a form of art. But your research shows that the position of the actor and the performer has become ever more precarious and vulnerable during this recent period of economic crisis and austerity, and that this is a global reality, with, for example, increasing use of unpaid workers and deepening insecurity for workers who are allowed to work. And the issue of work in the art sector, in the cultural sector, is not an issue only of the individual contract. It is about the recognition of what is the Then there are, these are issues for the publics of the world. And I suggest that we must be unequivocal in recognizing that the cultural space is wider than the economic space that is created, created by a traded economy. And it is crucial that we foster a public understanding of this central importance, the central importance of the public cultural space. We must also admit that at present, if I take the European community as an example, such an understanding does not exist at the level of European policy. And if it did, we would see policies that recognize that at times of economic contraction, you need more, not less, provision for public forms of cultural access. If one is not to add a cultural exclusion in terms of citizenship to the exclusions that are the experience of unemployment and the exclusions that come from the threat of poverty. I argued that 25 years ago at the Council of Ministers of the European Union. I got limited support very, very limited support. The public world was coming into, had been attacked since the 1980s. The hostility to the state was well underway. And yet if any of these ministers, heads of state, if they want to do today, they should go in the evening to the piazza where people are not talking meaningless bureaucracies to each other and are in fact doing their best to live. But the concept of the public world and the public space is crucial. You will be addressing issues too as to the environment in which you work yourselves. And of course those who fund and manage theatres also have responsibilities to create a just and inclusive environment which allows its members to flourish and realise their possibilities. Reference was made to the theatres that I had the opportunity to fund during the, the 1990s. But I realised too there were things that I didn't finish, such as, for example, the management of cultural facilities is a very different, 
form of management than the management found in different aspects of business. But I think the sets of obligations on employers can be summarised as the duty to provide an ethical workplace for workers. Recently, as President, I have launched a President of Ireland's Ethics Initiative, and that was a national consultative process which I've been hosting for the last year and a half. And the Irish Congress of Trade Unions ran a programme under the banner Ethical Workplace, working with their member unions, Congress, set apart gathering views from individual workers, workers' unions, representative bodies, of what are the essential qualities of a workplace that could be considered ethical. Unionised musicians, actors from the equity branch of SIPTU took part in the process. And of course, later on, they provided entertainment, the product of their labour and of their gift at the launch event we had for this in this very building, Liberty Hall. But what came out of that process was that workers' concern was with justice and fairness, that they sat, those issues sat side by side with a deep commitment to social justice and to a fair society. Not, they were not looking at it for themselves as performers. They were looking for the right thing to do uh, in society. Now, this isn't surprising, I'm sure, to this audience, as the cultural sector generally, and theatre in particular, has historically been in the vanguard in promoting tolerance, combating prejudice and discrimination in society. And you're also giving prominence, I know, to inclusion. I congratulate you on that. In the areas of gender, race, disability and sexuality, theatre has used its formidable emotional and political force to break down stigma and to destroy inherited forms of domination and oppression. And looking at the research material FIA has brought forward for the conference, I'm very confident that this leadership role will continue, but also that it can be extended with regard to the sector's capacity as employers, as well as its role in public advocacy on social issues. Equality, full respect for diversity within the theatre, I'm afraid remains yet an aspiration, but with the leadership of representative bodies such as FIA, it is an aspiration that I believe can be realised. The relationship between the actor as artist and as worker and her society is profound and multifaceted, and no discussion on the place and purpose of the arts can be complete without looking at the profound relationship that exists between all art forms and the society to which they respond or which they envisage. The work of artists has an exploratory significance that is as important as its interpretive role. It has, of course, in my view, a powerful emancipatory capacity. The enabling and supporting of our artists and the protection of their space of practice are essentials in the creation and sustenance of a truly functioning society. The health of its cultural space, its extent, its ranking, and the practitioners within it is reflective, I believe, of the quality of their whole society. Now, it must be acknowledged that Irish artists and Irish cultural institutions have, along with many sectors of Irish life, suffered significantly during a period that struggled with the consequences of a global, European and national kind of speculative economics and the austerity that served as a response. <coughs> when you prepare to go on stage, anyway, and you know what the role demands, your understanding of how it will be, that is very real. How contrasted that is to an abstraction that is called the economy, to which citizens must adjust their lives, their entire lifespans, and those that depend upon them. In the case of the economy, there is a problem in knowledge theory that you're dealing with an abstraction. In the case of the theatre, you go to have a life. The fact that cuts of around 40% to the annual budgets of the majority of our cultural institutions along with a reduction in funding for arts, culture and film by some 16 million between 2011 and 2014. That underlines the vulnerable place the arts are too often granted in our society and in the public consciousness and in the media discourse too. So many of our citizens have been Europe and beyond have been forced to choose 
not just between bread and roses, as is the phrase I should use in this building, but between survival and social life itself. And any view of the arts as something apart, something that occurs on the fringes of society, an optional extra, a residual of a time of economic growth, that is an extremely low priority, something that is given an extremely low priority in times of economic recession. That has to be challenged. It is regrettable that this reduction in funding has occurred despite the overwhelming evidence from independent source after independent source of the economic benefits that flow from what people call our creative sector. Funding for the arts is sometimes still perceived as being in the nature of some kind of grant support, rather than what it is, expenditure in the infrastructure of social life, joy and cohesion, which is what it really is. <laughs> the case then, the case for valuing our public expenditure investment in culture and the arts is an answer. But the value, too, practically, lies in the return that we receive from this expenditure at every level. The profound and valuable contribution that artists make to society cannot be overstated. It is so often through our encounters with literature, drama and art that we come to understand the human condition, <coughs> finding our perceptions challenged, clarified or enhanced, where we engage with the joy and the agony of the world. We know so well that here in Ireland that it is through the work of playwrights such as Shauna Casey, Samuel Beckett, John B. Keane, Hugh Leonard, Brian Freed, Marina Carr, my dear friend Tom Murphy and many others. And it occurred to me coming down as we celebrate the founding of the Irish state next year, once our centenary, every one of the revolutionaries was familiar with the work of Ibsen. Which I think that the interpretations of gifted workers in the theatre and the novel and in music and in dance, including the many people I, I recognise here today, people who have brought their words and their life to the stage and the screen, generations of audience, have followed the changing preoccupations of our nation, seeing, seeing the society differently with its beauty and its ugliness its dreams and its created nightmares that have formed our present and that challenge us to shape a future Ireland that we might craft together. And then even by the criteria of the market, we in Ireland might ask ourselves what sector has done more to enhance our national reputation or in what other sphere can Ireland claim to have such a rich tradition as an undisputed world leader? Jobs in the artistic sector they are more enduring than incomparable sectors, where countries all over the world, and there are people here from all over the world, where they've invested in theatre, film and television, the economic dividends have been demonstrable and significant. And I, as minister 25 years ago, had to make that case. However, if we are to recognise the true value of our artistic and cultural sector in any country or union, we must regard cultural policy as contributing to an essential part of our national infrastructure, enabling a space in the national practice and imagination that allows us to better understand ourselves. Reimagine ourselves too. If a cultural space is to be a truly enduring one, it must be a space within which various forms of creative activity are made possible. The vital role that arts and culture play in creating dynamic reflect and creative and reflective societies must be acknowledged. And again in that context, it could be argued that the provision and enrichment of creative spaces becomes, as I've said, ever more important in times of crisis and recovery, when there is a pressing need for a national process of re-evaluation and reflection. The public spaces to have conversations. And we need now all of us, not just in Europe, in so many parts of the world, to recover and enhance our public world together. I believe that it is essential to have a national cultural policy for citizens and those to whom they offer hospitality. 
You do it for yourself. And with dignity you are able to offer to those who visit you and those to whom you undertake the moral obligation of offering hospitality. It won a cultural policy that recognises the fundamental role of cultural access to citizenship and respecting the integrity and independence of the personal artistic inspiration. For any meaningful discussion about public funding for the art must be based on that principle. We will have to recognise that true access means more than just the possibility of entering public places of culture, the right to go in. It requires having access through a plurality of forms to the creativity of the self in interaction with others, to have the capacity to share, to enlighten and be emancipated and to be enlightened. In 1997, the report of the Cultural Committee of the Council of Europe in from the margins, stated, culture will have to be brought into the heart of public administration. In the specific case of theatre, this conference also recognises the need to engage with and constantly respond to an ever-evolving society. It is appropriate then that you are discussing the prospects and suitable place and role for the possibilities of technology. Technology has to be put within a frame that can meet the criteria of arts and culture and to see how it best can create new possibilities. Finally, the task of doing what I say, of recapturing a public cultural space, it will be essential if we are to meet the great challenges facing our international politics at this time. Challenges which require not merely a response from the few or the, per of the, or the perceived hegemony in the political and economic sphere. The notion that one or two heads of state in any region will have a conversation about the future for their peoples. This is what emperors did in the past, and empires are gone. I think that what is very important is that the discussion comes from the people themselves. The new Europe we want will have to come from the citizens of Europe. The current global challenges, such as how to marry ecology and development, of how to resolve current injustices of trade and debt, of gender equality, of appalling and continuing gender violence. These are all questions on which the artistic community in the past has given such a wonderful lead. And I know that in the future it will continue to do so, to give, to give leadership. The obvious fact, I'm afraid, of the borderless nature of artistic performance. It's uniting of spirits, bodies and peoples without borders. Sadly seems to be a motion, a notion, a concept, a strategy, a philosophy that so many of our leaders simply don't want to see, don't feel free to see, or perhaps are forced not to see by their being trapped within a utilitarian version of our lives. Thus, conflict, intolerance and extremism are on the rise in many regions of the world, often based on abusive interpretations of sacred texts themselves. A shared understanding of the diversity and processual nature of culture provides the ground on which interactions between traditions can take place in peace and mutual regard. It is our hope, and I believe yes, that culture can be a space of healing, a space of celebration, a space of the joy that we need sometimes. But it can only perform such a function if it is treated as central to democracy, essential for citizenship, and not as a mere commodity of economic surplus. Not as a palliative, but rather as a component of life that is energizing and emancipatory of the self and society. And self, it is not simply above all, not the last bag we haven't yet rattled for some economic benefit. The position of democracy itself is at the moment under pressure. Parliaments are ceding power and function to unaccountable economic centres of dominance. Faced with a growing sense of powerlessness in the face of alienating forms of technocratic dominance and unaccountable and disempowering economic models, often not free to be contested, Publics have become disengaged 
from participation in civic life, and they are becoming disillusioned with many of the political institutions available to them. At the European level in particular, if I may return to my example, much has been written of a democratic deficit, and the emergence from economic crisis leaders often speak about undertaking a re-engagement with the people of Europe. However, far beyond Europe and at global level, in this discourse, the role of what we share as a mosaic of our different cultural understandings as humans is rarely identified or recognised as a source of a new path to cooperation. And surely the obvious area where this might be productively advanced is in the area of culture, an area of civic life which enjoys the trust of the citizens of Europe an area of economic and social activity which stands blameless and removed from the institution and failings of banking sectors, which have so damaged the European social model over the past decade. And if we are, in the words of Jürgen Habermas, to rescue the public sphere, that's his words, not mine, we must remember that the public cultural space is a limitless resource, able to deliver many different models of living together, and then finally, going back to my European example, I argue we might usefully revisit the vision of Europe of which the Council of Europe was constructed in the post-war era and which later informed the founding of the European Union. A Europe conceived by Schumann, among others, was one in which the differences of ethnicity and language would give way to a shared sense of joy and an informed respect for a common cultural heritage. And there would be music too, the bond between the peoples of Europe and their cultures, and the value placed on that culture, and on all the different civilizations which had layered themselves on cultures, had crossed borders over centuries, was envisaged as the martyr that would link the former adversary nation states and disgraceful declining empires. But while the Council of Europe has undertaken important work in this area, the European Union has resisted, has not developed a viable and enabling cultural policy. Very small progress has been made in the area of education, over which they always wanted control in the nation states. But regrettably there is still a reluctance at policy level in Brussels to allow cultural policy, artistic institutions, even a full voice around the table. The, this principle of international cooperation founded on a respect for culture is one that can be applied at the global level. UNESCO is represented here. It is one of the United Nations institutions that has been neglected and underdeveloped and underfunded. And it has quite frequently been on the list for abolition altogether when United Nations reform is discussed. But I am a strong supporter of its potential. And I believe in what it has done. I remember the McBride report. I know the documents that UNESCO has produced, and it is important. I am a strong supporter of its potential, too, to contribute to resolving many of the great global challenges of which I have spoken. If given a proper central role, culture can provide the grist and the inspiration to build understanding in our divided and fragile world. Finally, and I, I just say this, returning to yourself, May I share with you an image, the position of the individual artist, the actor, the performer. I started in that very ancient language of our own. But when our own Gaelic traditions prevailed into the 17th century, in our ancient social order, a special esteem and status was accorded to the filler, a term which encompasses the role of poet, bard, seer, storyteller, scholar, and troubadour. The second rank in the clan. As your host, your world conference, your, work, your conference here in Dublin, I would like to tell you that Ireland is always at its best when it holds our actors and performers and those who visit us from overseas in high esteem. And I'm so pleased to be with you as President of Ireland on behalf of the Irish people. I am honoured that you have come among us and that you are discussing such important themes. I wish you well for your important conference. Thank you very much.